FUE Magazine, the authority on hair restoration surgery. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. I am on the show today with Morty. Uh, Morty's been somewhat of a superstar lately. He just co-hosted The Ball Truth with Spencer Coburn. His results coming a long way. His hair's looking full. And I uh, just wanted to touch base with Morty, ask him some questions, see how he was doing, and uh, and get his perspective on the uh, hair restoration field. We just wrapped up FUE, Ma- FUE Europe, and uh, Morty learned a ton about regenerative medicine. So, Morty, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your experiences lately, I'd love to hear from you, man. Absolutely. So, first of all, thank you for to uh, thank you for inviting me to this um, episode of FUE Magazine. It's my pleasure to join you as a um, as a patient of Dr. Cole's and a personal friend of his and a friend of the uh, a, a friend of the Four Hair uh, Clinic um, and a uh, happy recipient of uh, a number of procedures from Dr. Cole. I'm I'm very pleased with the results so far. Um, basically, uh, we are now at almost month 11 since um, my last procedure. Uh, that procedure was an FUE procedure that included um, grafts from the back and sides of my head as well as a few beard grafts. Uh, total graft count was uh, close to 4,000 grafts. Um, before this, I was a, a, a Norwood 5A primarily with, um, with a not, you know, with fine hair and with um, average to below average gender. And despite this, Dr. Cole was able to create a very uh, attractive, um, youthful hairline for me, and um, the, the hair's grown in quite nicely, as you can see. Um, I was also cordially invited by uh, Dr. Cole and his family to attend FU Europe for the first time, and to kind of see behind the scenes what the uh, uh, what the hair restoration industry looks like. Um, learned a lot about uh, different uh, modalities for treating hair loss, some of which I've had personal experience with, some of which I, I was able to learn. Uh, it was a great conference. Uh, there were a number of really um, interesting, um, uh, in, interesting lectures from a number of different doctors from around the world, talking about which, what each had each had done. Um, I learned a lot, um, and as uh, Nick said, also I, I was uh, blessed and uh, privileged to co-host the Ball Truth with Spencer Coburn on Friday, um, and get a chance to um, analyze some of the. Uh, the perspective uh, hair transplant, um, excuse me, perspective hair loss um, uh, callers and kind of understand what they're going through. So overall, that was a really great experience. Um, so I guess we could talk about we could talk about FU Europe first. Um, FU Europe was a, a wonderful one week um, in um, sunny Greece. Uh, we got a chance to uh, meet and, and learn from a number of doctors who were involved in regenerative medicine. Um, to talk about uh, various modalities of regenerative medicine, um, including the use of uh, adipose-derived stem cells um, and um, how they can be used for um, improving and and, and regenerating tissue in the face, and also how um, you can reseed the scalp with these stem cells in order to to revive um, dormant hair follicles. Um, and also to thicken up the fat layer um, in the scalp, which tends to get thinner over time, especially when dealing in um, an androgenic alopecia. Um, we had an, an, we had a number of really great doctors, uh, Dr. Angelo and uh, Dr. Pietro, who talked about uh, the uses of, of fat-derived stem cells in the scalp, um, and also to talk about um, the use of platelet-rich uh, platelet plasma in order to treat the scalp to rejuvenate um, hair follicles. Um, that was also really good. Um, we also, I was able to write um, a draft article, which will be coming out in FUE magazine very shortly. It's a uh, consumer's perspective on PRP, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I hope uh, you get out there soon you can read it. Um, I learned a lot of really important things about what, as a consumer, you should look for um, when getting PRP. Um, what it's like to deal with um, uh, hair transplant surgery and, and how you go about um, picking a good doctor and, and how you judge good from bad. There's a lot of bad doctors out there, and um, it's important to understand how to be able to figure out who the good and doctor uh, doctors are. We can talk about that as well. So um, what would you like to talk about first, Nick? <laughs> I want to hear about this new article you're releasing, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, uh, discussing okay. different different PRP kits. That sounds really interesting. How long have you been working on that article? 
Well, um, I did a draft a few weeks ago. Um, it, it was kind of something that I'd been thinking about um, for a while. And uh, one of the things that Dr. Cole um, started to do um, at the uh, at the conference was to try to culminate um, his his kind of bake off between the various different providers of PRP kits. And uh, again, from from a consumer's perspective, most people the main thing they know about PRP is is that there's a blood draw, so blood's taken out of your body. And then that blood goes through some mysterious process in order to create PRP, and then that PRP is reinjected into the area of concern. Um, if you're dealing with um, issues of joints or in dental implants and so on, the PRP goes into those areas. But for us, when we're talking about hair restoration, the PRP is going to go into the scalp. And the the, uh, the thing that Spencer Copeland often talks about is he says not all PRP is created equal. And there have been some some studies by uh, Dr. Paul Rose concerning different um, uh, different kits that are out there, and uh, the kits the kits um, quality the quality of the PRP they can create can vary uh, from kit manufacturer to kit manufacturer. And, and your dad, Dr. Cole, went into an even deeper dive, and he realized not only do kits vary from one manufacturer to another, but kits can vary from one kit to another from the same manufacturer. So that, it, that sort of variation really makes it difficult for a doctor to simply just use a kit and know that they've delivered a good quality PRP to their patient. Because if you can't even rely on following a kit's instruction to produce good PRP, then you're kind of left out in the cold. Um, so the, the things that are important to realize about PRP, first of all, as a consumer of PRP, is one, you have to kind of set your expectations. This means that um, you can't get blood from a stone. The most that PRP can do is it can stimulate dormant follicles. If the follicles are gone, there's nothing to stimulate. So if you were like me, when I started out, I, I was basically super slick bald, uh, no wood 5A, my, my frontal hair, my front, my, my front and mid, frontal mid scalp were basically shiny domes. And there was really not a whole lot of hair there to rescue. Um, something like PRP is not going to be terribly effective in the, under those conditions. Um, however, if you're in early stages of hair loss, um, you're just starting to see some thinning, PRP can be very useful under those conditions because there's a lot of follicles that can be revived. That's number one. Number two is, is, is that in order for um, PRP to be effective, the growth factors, which is what the which is the, the catalyst to reviving those hair follicles need to be present. And those growth factors are secreted by platelets. And if you don't have platelets in your PRP, well, then it's not really PRP. It's not really platelet-rich plasma. It's something else. Um, one of the things that Dr. Cole was able to discover that in some cases, the PRP that is getting injected, it has actually fewer platelets than the original uh, raw whole blood that was injected. So, it's, it's doing less than nothing. You've got blood circulating through your capillaries in your scalp right now. So adding more whole blood really doesn't do much. The key is, is, is to try to increase the number of platelets that you have in serum in that, in, that, uh, in that plasma that you're going to inject. And that's pretty much what the kids are supposed to do. Now, in order to be able to know whether you're doing the right thing, it isn't enough to get a good kit. You really need to know two things. One is, is you need to know what your baseline is. Um, this means essentially that um, you need to know how many platelets per microliter exist in your whole blood. And the only way to find that out is to measure it. Um, and uh, Dr. Cole has a Beckman Coulter CBC device, which is the same kind of device that the labs use when doing blood tests that you go to for a doctor. It's a machine that counts the number of different kinds of cells that are in, that are in the sample that you put in. Um, typically, um, most human beings can have between, uh, I, I think it's, um, let me pull up my article to pull it up. It could be as low as 140,000 platelets per microliter, um, all the way up to close to, um, close to 450,000, um, 450,000, uh, platelets per microliter. Um, so that's a huge variation. Um, and consequently, what you may end up with is if you start out with somebody who has very low platelets to begin with, let's say, um, let's, see here. Yeah, let, let's say that you started out with 140, 150,000 platelets, 
and then you you went ahead and used the poor kit, and then that number dropped from 150,000 per microliter to 190,000, you're not going to get any reaction at all. Um, the other thing that's important to also realize about platelets in raw blood plasma is, is they tend to drop as we get older. So if you're in your 60s, you could have up to 20,000 um, platelets per microliter lower than, say, somebody who was, say, in their 20s or 30s. Um, what all this basically means is, is, is that if you don't have an initial measure, you're not going to know how much blood you're going to need in order to get the number of platelets you need to cover your scalp. And a lot of these kits, they only pull, I don't know, maybe um, 10 milliliters, um, maybe 20 or 40 milliliters, whereas Dr. Cole typically will pull 110 milliliters. It's a lot more blood. More blood you start with, more platelets you start with. So that's, that's another really important point. So you got to get, get your baselines down to figure out how much you're starting with to know how much blood to start with. The second thing that you got to do is, is you got to measure the end count after the processing is done to see that you've actually concentrated your platelets. Could be that you diluted your platelets. You ended up with less platelets than you started, right? And that's not going to do anybody any good. So you can use that same Beckman-Coulter machine to analyze the PRP to see if you did a good job with your, your test kit. So that's, that's the second piece to it. So for my money, I wouldn't go to any doctor that isn't going to take a baseline and isn't going to take a final, uh, a final measure because you're wasting your time. Morty, I got so a that's question the, for you, man. What about uh, contaminants in the PRP? Does it make a difference if you have if it's loaded with red and white blood cells? Um, so to answer your question, um, red blood cells, if if your if your PRP has a lot of red blood cells, that can cause um, more pain um, when injecting the uh, the PRP into the scalp. How much more and how many more red blood cells is kind of up for debate. Um, but uh, a lot of manufacturers are focused on basically ensuring that they get the yellow PRP as opposed to pink PRP, which means that there's a little bit of red blood cells in there. The problem with getting pure yellow is, is, is that you're, you're leaving on the table a number of platelets because the platelets in, in the, uh, the platelets in the Buffy coat are where the, are, are, there's a lot of concentration in there, and the Buffy coat is right on the edge where you're starting to get a few red blood cells in there. But um, a, lot of the, a lot of the vendors out there, I think Pure PRP, they try their best to get rid of the red blood cells at the expense of losing some platelets. So from where, I, from where I believe Dr. Cole sits, I don't necessarily think, think that he believes, and again, I don't want to speak for your dad, but I don't think he necessarily believes that uh, an occasional red blood cell is going to cause any real harm. Mostly it's, it, it, could, it could cause a little bit of pain and perhaps a little bit more inflammation, but um, I know that inflammation isn't necessarily a bad thing because it, it also is a sign that the healing mechanisms are kicking in. And Dr. Cole told me this, and that is, is that the age of the platelets. Remember, um, what we didn't really talk about is the process. So uh, typically what we do is after the blood's extracted, um, it goes into a centrifuge. And what a centrifuge does is it spins the, um, it, it spins the vials of blood so that it forces the heavier um, particles to the, outer, to, the, uh, to the end of the tube and the lighter particles to the other end. Um, and that's why you end up with red in one half of the tube and yellow in the other half, and then a little region in between, which is what they call the Buffy coat. Um, the problem basically is, is, is that um, as a rule, your red blood cells are going to be heavier than your, uh, than your white um, and your plasma, and that's why they're going to end up on the end. But um, there's variation, right? Um, and th that variation can cause some of those, um, some of those red blood cells to hang, hang around further up the tube, and it can cause some of those platelets to hang around further down the tube. And, uh, and uh, I believe Dr. Cole believes that the younger, newer um, platelets um, will be, you know, uh, possibly further in that, in that buffy coat, in, on the red side of that buffy coat, number one. Number two is, is, is that there are cells um, that, that create the platelets, they're, they're the platelet, uh, the, the 
the, uh, the, the uh, platelet stem cells, which are larger, and they, you know, they, they can also end up in a different part of that, um, in a different part of that distribution. One of the things that uh, Dr. Cole noticed is he did a, an analysis, a post analysis of a post spin, and he saw platelets all the way down to the bottom of the red. So that separation is no, uh, by no means perfect or, or complete. There is a loss when you do a spin of about 15%. So if you started out with 140,000, uh, let's say 140,000 um, platelets per microliter in whole blood, um, and then you spun it down to say half, all right, potentially what you should see should be about 280, uh, 280 platelets per microliter, but in practice, we lose about 15% of those. And the loss is that some of those hung around in an area that you left behind when you just took um, that, the, the bottom half of the, uh, the yellow plasma and the, and the buffy coat. So some of those hung around in, on the periphery and they got lost. So that can happen. Um, the second thing is, is typically most uh, PRP kits or the good ones, the, the pure PRP I believe doesn't even do a second spin. They, they rely on, um, on some gel to absorb the, this, to absorb the reds at the bottom of, the, uh, of their vial. But other PRP kits like the Enzyme will demand a second spin. And that second spin further um, concentrates the platelets, but it also further loses some of the platelets. So you don't necessarily get all of those 140,000 per micro, uh, per milliliter. So it isn't simply, hey, you know, we went from, say, um, 110 uh, milliliters to, um, to 50, for, you know, to, uh, to uh, 55 milliliters for the first spin where we lost half the volume. And then maybe we did the second spin and we lost another half. So that would bring us to like uh, about 25 and a quarter milliliters. Um, it doesn't mean that you quadrupled the, um, the concentration because it's not perfect. You're going to. Awesome, Morty. I got another question, man. Once you make uh, PRP. Oh, I made a mess just like Joe did today. I spilled yeah. coke. He spilled wine. Um, so I'm going to switch back to you here in just a second, and also grab a towel. But let me get back to the uh, the question at hand. Uh, once mm -hmm. you separate the platelets, um, you want to. Or it's not necessarily what's in the platelets; it's, it's the growth factors. What are some of the ways yeah. patients are able to? Uh, I'm sorry, doctors are able to harvest those growth factors or promote the... Yeah, so obviously, you know, a platelet by itself really doesn't do much good because they're floating around your blood all the time. And if they started acting out, um, if, the, if the platelets started acting out and releasing their growth factors willy-nilly, you would have all sorts of problems in your body, right? You could get clots inside your veins and bad things would happen. The way the platelets typically work is when there's an injury to the body, the platelets go to work and they, they, they go ahead and they, they create this matrix of, or like a spider web of, of tendrils that they stick out and then they bind to each other. And when they do that, um, they also release growth factors. And the thing about it is, is that platelets only do that when they're quote unquote active. And um, activating of platelets is essentially what, um, uh, what you need to do in order for them to work. Otherwise, you can inject them in your scalp and then they'll just go ahead and they'll float away back into your bloodstream and they won't do any good. So you've got you've to gotta do something to activate those platelets. So um, some people activate their platelets using um, calcium chloride, which is a, a chemical that changes the pH of the platelets and, and causes them to, to, to become active. Um, some people, um, like your like dad, Dr. Cole, they use sonication to activate those platelets. And sonication is just a fancy word for um, basically sending um, sonic energy um, into the um, into the mix to to basically burst those platelets with sonic sonic energy. Um, so he'll sonicate those platelets before putting them in as a way of activating them. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Cole also does is he uses that Beckman Coltler machine. So he'll he'll take a measurement initially. We say okay, we started out at 140 uh, at 140k uh, per microliter platelets. We we, ju we we juiced it up with the with the centrifugation and the separation to say a million or a million and a half platelets, then we're going to sonicate that and then suddenly our platelet numbers are going to go all the way to near zero. 
And what happened to all the platelets? Well, the sonication burst them, so they're no longer integral. They're not, you know, they're not um, little platelet cells anymore. They're, their platelets are, are basically uh, demolished, and the innards have been kicked out. And that, those innards are those, those growth factors, those, uh, those uh, you know, vascular endothelial growth factor, insulin growth factor, uh, you know, transforming growth factor, um, platelet, platelet growth factor, and all these different growth factors which are messages that those cells, like your hair follicle cells, will pick up and they'll say, oh, it's time for us to grow. It's time for us to, to wake up and, and start making new hair. Um, so that's the sonication is another way to activate uh, those platelets so that they release their growth factors. I'm glad we cover growth factors. I wanted to ask you now, um, you know, we're, you're a big proponent of regenerative medicine. I know we were discussing adipose. Uh, what did you discover about adipose while you were there? Okay, so that's another really interesting um, that's another really interesting topic. So I received PRP uh, both from from your dad, Dr. Cohen. I've received PRP from Dr. Greco, and and I've had some really positive results uh, in PRP in my joints. I had uh, PRP done to my knees, to my ankles, and it, they've helped me to to stay fit and to and to basically uh, alleviate some of the aches and pains from being somebody who's over, you know, somebody who's middle-aged and older. Um, and also, uh, the PRP has done a fair amount to encourage growth in, um, in my hair. And also, it really did a good job at making sure that my, uh, my transplant results were strong and were uh, early. Uh, I, I basically was able to grow out the hair very quickly. I would say that probably 90% of all of my grafts were already sprouted by month four whereas a lot of people may have to wait until their ninth or tenth month before uh, they are completely grown out. And as you can see, I'm, I'm still pretty good. Um, so that's as far as PRP is concerned. Now, um, when we're talking about a factor of stem cells, that's a, that's a, a different thing. Uh, it's similar in the sense that it also involves growth factors and messaging, but it's different in that um, – it's a lot more, it's a lot longer lasting because what you're doing is you're transplanting cells. Um, platelets are not alive when they get burst. They're just bundles of growth factors, and they really can't split and, and create new cells. When you move, um, when you move uh, stem cells to a new location, they can continue to live in that location for months and continue to produce good quality um, growth factors for months on end and and at least there's some evidence that they can be they, they can differentiate into skin cells and fibroblasts and other kinds of cells um, and make the surrounding tissue act as if it's younger than before the injection so that's kind of an important thing to understand about it um, i can talk specifically about what the process is like because i've had well, um, I, I want to ask you this. Uh, so we know as you age, do we, you lose stem cells or their telomeres become shorter and shorter. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons we started looking at adipose is we started exploring areas of the scalp and areas with more hair loss tend to have less fat tissue, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we just kind of want to re repopulate the area to make it a better living environment. Um, and the CRP will kind of boost the effects of the adipose stem cells. Um, it helps yeah. prolong it a little bit. But yeah, tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about the procedure. Yeah, so that's kind of an important thing to understand. Um, we talked a little bit about PRP. It's simply a blood draw and then injection. Um, the the effect of stem cell is a little bit more of an ordeal, but it's still nothing. It's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, basically, what they do is um, they'll numb uh, either an area or in your abdomen or your thigh. Um, and then uh, they'll inject um, they'll inject some um, some fluid to kind of loosen up the, the fat in the, in the area, and then they'll use uh, a blunt um, a blunt metal instrument called a cannula um, to basically um, reach into the fatty area and and draw off or suction off the the loose fat. Um, that fat then has to go through a similar process to extract the stem cells, just like we had to extract platelets. There, um, it's a little different because in the, in the fat tissue, you have three things. You've got um, adipose cells, which are these big, you know, these big globules of fat, big fat cells. You have um, scaffolding or matrix, which is the thing that keeps the fat together. And those cells are like, they're, they're, they're uh, collagen-based cells. And the, the stem cells ha are hanging onto those, um, onto those bits of scaffolding. So 
what what you have to do is, is you have to break up that structure in order to liberate the the, um, the stem cells, and then you have to filter out the stem cells from the fat cells. So there's a couple of ways to do that, um, and there's a couple of different companies that are doing it. One way is, is they, they use what they call um, an enzymatic digestion. This is basically the use of, a, uh, of an enzyme called collagenase to basically break up those collagen, um, those collagen structures that are tying the fat together it, instead of having them be this lumpy kind of gelatinous fat into what they call micro or, or, or um, nano fats, which are you know, more, much thinner and more watery. And then the oil that was trapped in the fat will also get, those fat cells will get released. Um, after that, the second step is just to kind of filter out the stem cells from the fat cells that we, what you end up with is just stem cells. And there again, you're going to use centrifugation. You're going to put it in the centrifuge and you're going to spin those down. And what happens is, is, is that you're going to end up with a little white uh, pellet at the bottom of your test tube called a pellet. And that primarily is going to be your stem cell. Those stem cells in turn are then going to be remixed in with your PRP and are going to be injected into the scalp just like you did with PRP. And also, there, there can be some reinjection of fat as well because that provides those cells with uh, additional, um, additional uh, nourishment and those fat cells can also uh, embed themselves just like the stem cells can. Um, I wanted to also kind of touch base with you on, uh, so we did basically comparison of different types of PRPs out there, right? Um, do you know, so what did you learn from, uh, from the various companies and, and as far as their platelet counts, did you, did, were you able to f find out the different counts on different, uh, different kits? Prices? Um, well, no, no, unfortunately, not, not, not prices, but, uh, concentrations. Yeah. Uh, um, so that, that information is, uh, is stuff that, uh, Dr. Cole was putting together during the, uh, during the meeting. I'm actually waiting to get the, um, the actual material with the actual counts. Um, but what I can tell you is, um, you know, the, the, different, the different kits will use different um, starting amounts. So that's the, the first clue is to whether, whether you're dealing with a good or a bad kit. You wanna make sure that the, that the kit that you're gonna use uses a large volume of, um, of, of whole blood to start with. So pure PRP, for example, uses only, I think, 10 milliliters to start. Um, so, you know, at best, you're not going to end up with a, a large volume to inject. And if you're doing the whole head, you're going to need a lot more than, you know, whatever it's going to be, two or three milliliters to cover that, to cover that whole scalp, even in the best of circumstances. Whereas other kits, you know, other kits will use, um, 60, 50 to 60 uh, milliliters, which gives you more, uh, more, uh, whole blood to start with. But Dr. Cole recommends the use of up to 110. So, some, right. um, so and you were mentioning so, blood concentrations. Different kits suggest different uh, different concentrations of blood. Uh, uh, but well, didn't we have some kind of protocol established there where you had to follow this regimen, only harvest this amount of blood, and then we see what your kit was able to produce from that amount of blood, if I'm not mistaken? Well, uh, again, um, I, I believe Dr. Cole during his um, – during his bake-off that he did, he, he basically wanted to try to normalize the different kits. But again, a lot of these kits are aimed at different markets. So uh, the Pure PRP kit is aimed at a, a kind of a medi-spa market. And there the goal is to try to minimize the discomfort of the, um, uh, of the client um, as opposed to produce useful results. Um, so that they basically use a very small amount of blood. They'll use, I believe, it's probably 10, 9 or 10 milliliters. Whereas um, if you went, say, with the Magellan kit or the Enzyme kit, they'll use a much larger volume. They'll use 40 or 50 milliliters to start. A lot of, cust a lot of you know, people don't like to have a lot of blood drawn. But the truth is, is, is that you can't, you can't make an omelet unless you've got the right number of eggs. So, um, and, and if you're dealing with a person who's got low platelet count, you have, may have to draw even more. You may have to use more than one kit to get enough, um, to get enough PRP to actually uh, make a difference. But that's not something that the kit is going to tell you. Um, kits are, at the end of the day, kits are basically, they're, they're kind of one size fits all. So they're developed for easy use of the doctor and for trying to cut down on the amount of knowledge necessary to uh, to, to produce a result. 
Um, but as as um, as anyone can tell you, any shortcuts usually have an effect on the end product. I mean, if just to 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 compare it to something else, um, I don't think you'd want to, for example, get a hair transplant with an artist device, even if it's easier for the doctor to do it, because it's a cookie cutter approach where basically it's one size fits all, and every patient is different. And the same thing goes for PRP. Some people's blood concentrations are much lower than others, um, so you're going to have to draw more blood. Um, some people may have fewer, um, you know, fewer stimulatable um, follicles, and therefore you may have to introduce more growth factors for them. Um, that's number two. And number three is a lot of this is still in, in the process of being researched. There isn't any real standardized amount of platelets to use or standardized way of activating those platelets. So the best thing that you can do is, is you, as a consumer is, is you're going to want to ask questions. You want to ask the doctor, you know, how much blood they're going to draw. You're going to want to ask the doctor if they're going to check your baseline platelets. You're going to want to make sure that the doctor is going to check end concentrations before injecting. You're going to want to ask the doctor what it is they're going to use to activate those platelets if they activate them at all. Um, you know, a lot of those things are going to have an effect on what the end result is going to look like. The other thing to also remember about PRP is that PRP is not one and done. Um, what you're getting at best, you're getting a burst of growth factors for a short period of time. So that's like if you did, um, that's if you take a protein shake after a workout, right? If you want to build muscle, you're not going to just take one protein shake. You're going to take protein shakes on a regular basis for a period of time in order to give your body the protein it needs to build up muscle. Same thing goes with, with PRP and growth factors. You're going to more likely than not have to come back for top-ups of your PRP in order for it to really be effective. You can't expect it to just be one and done. Now, if you compare that with, say, um, if, you know, adipose drive stem cells, there you're not just dealing with a quick burst of um, growth factors. You're dealing with living cells that are, going to, that are going to hang around in the area of effect and they're going to continuously produce both growth factors and um, progenitor cells that are going to turn into new skin and possibly even new hair follicles. So you're saying that we have to, you have like a protein shake, you have to continuously drink it. How often are patients having to get this PRP kits done, uh, provided it was standard PRP released with calcium glycosinate compared to uh, higher grade CRP treatments, uh, kind of like Dr. Cole and Dr. Greco are offering. Um, so tell me a little yeah. bit about that. So, um, okay, so you mentioned two really good doctors, and I've been, I've had, I've been blessed to have um, treatments with both of them. And what I can tell you is, is, is that there's a difference of opinion there a little bit. Um, Dr. Greco is, he's, he's kind of into the whole idea of having the, having the platelets be trapped in a matrix so that the, they can, they can kind of hang around in the space and reduce and, and, uh, and produce or release their growth factors over a longer period of time. Your dad, Dr. Cole, believes in sonication, and he so he believes in 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 sonicating those platelets and you know getting a burst of growth factors. Now, um, once a growth factor is absorbed by a cell, um, it's unclear how long that that is going to have an effect on that cell over time. But what I can tell you is that. Um, Typically, you're going to want to have, uh, and again, this, this was with, uh, with Dr. Greco, he was basically saying that you needed to come back, I would say, every three or four months for a top-up. Um, I believe your dad, I think he, he seemed to believe that you could do it every eight or nine months. Again, I, I could be wrong about that. So the top-ups may not necessarily have to happen as quickly. But the reasons behind why one versus the other happen is a matter of debate because different doctors have different opinions on that. And for, I mean, there's even more complications when you talk about other products like um, uh, uh, PRF or platelet rich fibrin. There um, you've got that same idea where there's this fibrin, this matrix of this fibrin matrix, which is kind of like a, like that cobweb we, we talk about just, it, it holds cells and in, in place for longer periods of time. People seem to be using that as well. But the funny thing about PRF is, is a PRF doesn't involve a whole lot of platelets because the platelets have basically created a matrix, so they're not as dense anymore because they're spread out and they've created these tendrils. 
Um, but people have had good results with that stuff as well. Um, there's a lot of these words being bandied about, but ultimately the most important thing is results as far as I'm concerned. Have you seen a uh, difference as far as the result goes with patients that have had PRF, inje PRF injections versus without? Ah. Uh, Personally, no, I can't say that I have. I've only just kind of read the read the literature and what people are talking about. So personally, I can't say that I have. Well, uh, we just had a physician come in from uh, Greece, and we did, did uh, PR injections into his beard. And uh, nice. by four days post-op, there was no signs of scabbing. It was just a little red. Now, he was using an ointment as well to, to help get the scabbing off quicker. But, I mean, that was an unbelievable amount of time. Usually it takes about... Four days, it still looks like a little bit of razor burn, uh, kind of some cut, like a like a cut here, maybe a cut there. But for it to yeah. be unnoticeable four days post-op, I thought was pretty unbelievable. So we did well, see I, it uh, accelerate the healing process, which was interesting. The PRF, I can speak to I can speak to PRF specifically in the donor area. I think that, that I do have experience with because, um, and I can send you pictures, but. Um, what uh, what uh, Dr. Cole did for me is, is he put PRF into the donor area. Um, and not only that, I've seen Dr. Cole also use A-cell into the donor area as well. And in both of those cases, you, you're once again dealing with growth factors. Um, A-cell is an interesting uh, product that Dr. Cole will use in the donor area. And what it is, is it's, a, it's desiccated um, uh, porcine um, bladder, um, bladder cells. So... Uh, that stuff is interesting because what what the bla the bladder is um, you know it holds a liquid which is very caustic right urine is pretty caustic you don't want your urine leaking out into the rest of your body because it can wreak havoc it's got a it's got a you know it's got an acidic pH and um, ultimately the lining of your bladder has to be uh, a lining of cells that is going to basically turn over really quickly because the cells that are that are touching the urine are gonna aren't going to last very long so. What the body does is it has a high degree of, um, of growth factors on the inside of the, uh, of the bladder so that the cells can, can grow really rapidly and turn over very quickly to keep the bladder from, you know, from degrading. So what these clever doctors did was they basically took that, that first few layers of... Um, of we, 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 can, we can just call it pig's bladder. Kind of, throw, kind, of, kind of throw a shocker out there, but it does work. And I actually saw a very interesting article about them researching pigs to use their kidneys in humans for uh, kidney yeah. transplants. So, um, well, you know, I, their anatomies are very similar to ours. Pig, pigs are very, very similar to, um, to us in terms of, um, of, uh, of our biology. And so, but again, what the, what the goal here basically is, is, is you want to you wanna speed up the healing process. And what, what the ACL does is it speeds up the healing processes and, and, and at least in some cases it can cause not just um, quick, uh, quick healing but regeneration, which is really interesting. Um, so it'll, it'll cause those, it'll, it'll cut down in the number of scabs or you know, the amount of redness, number one, but it'll cut down in the amount of scar tissue that it'll form. And instead of scar tissue, what you're going to end up with is regenerative tissue, which looks like the original tissue that was removed. And in some cases, it can even regenerate hair follicles. Um, Dr. Cole, in his experience, has found that uh, people can regain up to 40% of the hair follicles that were transplanted in the original donor. And I can tell you from my experience that in this area here where Dr. Cole pulled the, uh, the majority of my, uh, of, uh, of my grafts, for the first few weeks, I noticed that it didn't grow in as thick as um, as when um, as when it was removed, but right now I run my hair, I can run my hands through it, and it feels just as thick as as uh, before the transplant. And I know that that means that at least some of those transplanted hairs came back, um, and they can come back for a variety of reasons. One is is that um, when you when you when Dr. Cole does his extractions, he can sometimes leave behind a little bit of the um, of the bulb which contains the, uh, the follicle. Uh, the follicle stem cells, and then those can, with enough go goading and coaxing from things like P CRP or A cell um, or um, CRF, can goad them to going back and producing a brand new hair. Um, but the other side of it is, 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 that, is that this regeneration can put the flesh in a mode, uh, almost in a pre-embryonic mode, which can cause those hairs to basically regenerate completely. Um, so 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a good it's a good adjunct. It's the kind of thing that you're going to want your doctor to do for you when getting a hair transplant, whether that um, donor is your is your head hair or your beard hair. When we were uh, over there in Europe, did did you have a chance to speak with a bu- bunch of doctors? I know that meeting was particularly designed about regenerative medicine. Yeah. But how many doctors we that you spoke with were offering regenerative medicine? Um, so Dr. Ryan Walter, he's a, he's a big regenerative medicine guy. He actually worked with Dr. Cole on my, uh, on my second factor of stem cell extraction. Um, so I had a chance to speak with him. Um, and Dr. Pietro Gentile, um, from Italy. Um, he, he was also one of the lecturers there on regenerative medicine. Um, I have to pull up the list of, of attendees, but there was a, there was, um, a Dr. Angelo, um, he's another doctor who worked um, pretty heavily with regenerative medicine and the use of, uh, of factor of stem cells. Um, we had um, Giannis. Who, who, doc, Dr. Giannis, and um, nice. we had an opportunity on the first day that we were there. Dr. Aris Therdimus, he actually is a, is a big user of, um, of, fat, derived, of, of, of fat products in, um, in other things that are not directly related to hair loss, having to do with the things like uh, lipografts into into the face, um, uh, lipografts in, into other parts of the body, like um, using lipografts into um, into the glutes, into the um, into the breasts to do reconstructive surgery and, and enhancements. Um, so you know, fat derived stem cells is being is being used in lots of other parts of the body. The nice thing about those results is they're long lasting. So, for example, um, with respect to using fat derived stem cells in in um, in lycographs and fillers, um, if you did a filler to someone's face uh, using standard filler um, chemicals, those fillers will dissipate or get reabsorbed into the body over a year or two, and then you have to come back and get those fillers again. And what's worse is, is that those fillers eventually create pockets of, um, in your skin, which require you to have to go back and put more filler in to get rid of these fine lines and so on. But if you use um, a, a lipograft with fat stem cells, they actually anchor themselves into the, um, into the flesh so that that fill is permanent for it, as long as you've got your face. And the same thing can be said about the scalp. So one of the um, hallmarks of, um, of, um, of androgenic alopecia in addition to hair loss is that the flesh in here becomes a lot um, a lot thinner, um, and you can tell it's part of the reason why I think that you, one's head becomes shinier is, is that the skin on top of the bone gets thinner, and the, the layer of fat that's in between the bone and the skin gets thinner and thinner, and that lack of fat and stem cells, it starves the hair, one could argue, and it may be at least part of the reason why you get hair loss. In addition, you also get... Um, uh, a lot of scarification that happens, a lot of fibrosing scarification that happens. Both of those processes can be reversed with the introduction of, um, of stem cells into the area. Your, the, the, the skin looks better, it looks plumper, it looks more youthful, and that can only benefit the hair that's going to be growing out of it. Well, uh, no comments from the peanut gallery on that. <laughs> Um, let's, uh, let's, we're rolling to something a little bit different, my friend. And actually we had a, a, a patient, uh, not a, no, a prospective patient, uh, come on, on the air with you, uh, last weekend, right? Um, yeah. and he That's was, an interesting one. yeah, we could talk about that. So, um, you know, I gotta, I gotta just preface this by saying that hair loss is a difficult thing to go through. Um, I started losing hair when I was 19 years old and at the time I was, uh, an amateur musician, I was trying to break into the pros, and this is the ninth, in the, the 80s, which is the, uh, the time where having lots of long hair was kind of the image that people were going for. And um, I remember my guitar player telling me, and I, I have naturally curly hair, so I was trying my best to grow it out, um, much like, you know, Eddie Van Halen and, and um, you know, uh, Poison and a lot of those bands that were popular at the time. And my, my guitar player turned to me and said, dude, he said, your hair's not growing out. It's worse. He said, it, it looks like you're losing your hair. He said, if you want to stay in this band, you're going to have to wear a long hair wig because otherwise you're just not going to fit in. And man, that broke my heart, man. That really, that really just did me in. And I had to walk away from music almost all together. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can be heartbreaking. And the particular patient we're talking about, the uh, 28-year-old guy who... Um, 
through most of his his um, his youth, had a high forehead to begin with, and over the last six or seven years, like over the last six or seven years, he he had basically resigned himself to to shaving his head, um, and he was never all that thrilled with the way he looked. Um, so now he's about 28, and, and he went to come see Dr. Cole, and Dr. Cole um, had, and you actually had 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 me speak to him, and, and he's been struggling. I mean, he he got onto a topical finasteride and actually got some pretty good results with the topical finasteride. He um, he was able to um, increase the quality of both the donor hair in terms of the number of of, of hairs in antigen, as well as strengthen and thicken up some of the hair in his mid scalp. So. Overall, that was a, in my opinion, that was a great win for him because it meant that um, he, you know, getting a, a transplant would require the use of less grafts, um, and you know, if he stayed on those meds, he wouldn't need m further procedures down the line. Unfortunately, he went to go see his um, his GP, and he got some blood work done. And um, when they when they took his blood work. Uh, they did a test which is really inappropriate for men, which is they did a total estrogen test on them. Um, total estrogen tests are really more for women. Um, they aren't tests to measure men's estrogen. Typically, if you want to know about men's estrogen, you're going to measure estradiol. And the number he got uh, put his estrogen um, outside of the normal range, above the normal range. And uh, one of the things that can happen with um, – with finasteride or other types of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors like dutasteride or um, even some of the natural ones is, is it causes a boost in testosterone because the testosterone doesn't get oxidized into um, dihydrotestosterone. And if, if, it doesn't get, if it doesn't get converted to DHT, there's a possibility that uh, the body can use aromatase, which is an enzyme that can convert those testosterones into, into estradiol, into estrogen. And so what you can end up with is you can end up with, a, with a, an increase in estrogen. And for some people, that can be problematic. It can cause things like um, the formation of gynecomastia, which is... Um, Man the, boobs. Yeah, what they, what, they call, <laughs> well, I, what they called in the movie Fight Club, they called it bitch tip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, which is obviously something that nobody wants to get. Um, so... That didn't happen to this guy. Um, he he basically he he was fine in the bedroom. His wife had no complaints, but he saw a number that scared him, and so he backed off. And I told him, look, if you're going to do that, understand that those gains that you've gotten are probably going to drop. And what's worse is is you may have a you may have a boomerang effect because you went from adding all of this um, all of this extra testosterone into your body. To suddenly having it drop back, and your body is perhaps your body is in that mode of, of, of creating those those um, aromatases, and now you're going to end up with a spike in estrogen and a drop in testosterone, and getting off the drug can be just as harmful as as getting it on it. You know, you might want to wean yourself off you're going to get off it at all, and you're going to have a big old shed. So that was kind of my warning to him. Um, personally, I wish that I was 28 years old when I found out about this medical therapy, because I probably wouldn't have needed surgery at all. Although admittedly, by the time I was 28, I was already well on my way. Um, but I can tell you that I probably would have recovered more hair than I did at, you know, at, at 50. Um, so, you know, it's a tough call for a, for a, um, for a person to have to balance these things. I mean, look, if you're trying to have a kid, you know, there is at least some there's at least some likelihood that being on a five alpha uh, five alpha reductase inhibitor may be uh, may cause some issues with with fertility possibly. There may be some issues with semen volume. Um, you know there may be some issues with libido. Maybe your libido isn't quite what it was before you got on it. But a lot of that could also be psychosomatic, right? Um, but again, you know, it's something that each person needs to judge for themselves in terms of medical therapy. The evidence is there. It's also true that um, if you use a topical finasteride, it's going to cause less systemic absorption. doesn't mean you're not going to get any, as, as it happened in this particular person's case. He was using the topical at a very low dose. But he still ended up with some degree of systemic uh, penetration of the, of the, um, of the drug. So it can happen, but less of it can happen with topical. 
Um, so that's another important thing to note. But if it turns out that 5 alpha reductase inhibitors really aren't right for you, there are other options. We already talked about them. We talked about CRP. We talked about fat-derived stem cells. But the one thing I can say as a recipient of, um, of a hair transplant, I wouldn't want to get to go through the ordeal of having to get a hair transplant, having to, you know, spend the time and the money to get a hair transplant, only to then find the hair behind it start falling out. And then you end up with a situation which aesthetically is worse than when you started. I know there's a number of, uh, there's a number of images on Dr. Cole's website of people who had come to Cole and had asked that their grafts be removed and they could go back to looking like a normal bald person because of some bad decisions both by a surgeon and by themselves by not trying to treat their baldness. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the Internet's littered with uh, people who've had hair transplants early in life and then subsequently lost hair behind it and them having to go ahead and shave anyway, almost like a waste of money. I mean, one of the biggest examples of this is Joe Rogan. He had a hair transplant, a number of scarch, uh, a number of um, strip procedures, and in the end, he had to shave his head, and he had, he unfortunately ended up with a um, with a scar in the back of his head as a result, and no real good hair to show for it. A lot of this, I would argue, can be attributed to a lack of medical therapy. Anyway, that's my two cents on it. Well, I, I agree with you on that, and, and you know, it's, so I, I remember kind of you guys talking about. Um, you know, you, you got to inform the patient on, on possible negative outcomes, right? What well, may look good yeah. now may not look good 30 years from now. And while we don't have a crystal ball, um, when we do write-ups, we always throw in worst case scenario. This is what you can expect. This is what we've seen from guys 30 years later. And a lot of it comes off as bad news. You know, they're like, well, you're telling me I got to worry about this. This other guy's telling me he can accomplish these goals and I'll look fine. They're not digging into the negatives of the procedure. So, uh, and I think that, um, one of the problems that happens is, and you know, this is true of any, uh, of any hair transplant surgeon, hair transplant surgeons make the majority of their money by doing surgery. Okay. That's where they make their money. No bones about it. And you know, Dr. Cole's no exception. He makes his money by doing surgery. Okay. But a, you know, uh, a good, a moral, um, doctor, will not harm a patient because the Hippocratic Oath says as much. Do no harm. So you have to be straight with that patient. And as a patient, you have to understand the motivations on the part of your doctor. If the doctor is telling you something you want to hear, recognize that that's what's happening. Okay? If a doctor can tell you, oh, sure, I can do that for you, and he's glossing over those, those other things that you need to be aware of, just be aware of it, that he's mainly interested in getting that money out of your wallet. So um, make sure, because the one thing that can be also true, you get somebody 27, 28 years old, gets an initial procedure to kind of nice, you know, widen out that, you know, widen out that hairline, lower down that hairline a little bit. Next thing you know, the hair behind it is going, so now you got to go in for a second procedure to fill that in. Next thing you know, the crown's starting to go, you got to get another procedure for that. Before you know it, you're into four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten procedures. And, you know, that's a lot of money you're talking about and a lot of heartache. You want to make sure that before you get on that treadmill that you understand where you're headed. Take a look at your parents, your dad. Take a look at your mother's father. Take a look at your uncles. See what they looked like when they were in their 40s and 50s. And as a 53-year-old man, understand that if you're 28 and you think, ah, I'm not going to care what I look like when I'm 40, trust me, you will. And the, and the unfortunate part about all this is we are all aging. We, we can't continue to work our whole lives, you know. Eventually, we're going to hit 65, right? And next thing you know, we, we're completely thinned out. And we're uh, or actually maybe three years before retirement. We got to think about, all right, do I want to spend, my, spend some of my retirement money on a transplant? Or uh, do I just want to forget about it? But if I forget about it, well, uh, even if it's a natural result, you, you people may not be able to tell you've had something done, but you can. And you're just thinking, man, I wish I could add some density up there, just thicken it up. That way it doesn't look as obvious. But, I mean, I've seen some really good results, and just patients can't live without how much they've thinned out. And then, you know, like, uh, they'll do crown work. They'll do a bunch of crown work. I'll talk to them. Hey, what do you think of the crown work? He said, 
I don't know. I don't. I don't even get to see back there. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an unfortunate well, I, part. Yeah. I mean, look. Um, I'm very grateful for the result that I've gotten. I'm very pleased, as you can see, looking head on. I look like I've got a, a, a beautiful full head of hair. But if I dip down, I actually you really can't. I don't know if you can see this. If you can actually see it down about here, this is where we ended. From here up, this needs this needs some additional work. But when you're looking at me head on, I'm very pleased with the result. So um, you have to make decisions about what's important and what's not important. Um, with respect to uh, to when you're getting your work done, but the main thing is is you don't want to you don't want to leave any options off the table, man. You want to attack this with as many tools as you can have in your toolbox. You want to use medical therapy, you want to use regenerative medicine, and you want to use surgery if you really truly want to keep your hair. Up. Um, I got a question for you, Morty. Hold on, let me split this screen. What do you sure. think about a 70 year old man building a bowl shaped hairline and looking like Brad Pitt? With minimum hair loss. Well, I would I would say this: if if you had a seventy year old man and you wanted to get an eighteen year old hairline on his head, I would suggest that he go out and get a wig. <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually, for two reasons. One is is because that's probably the only way that he's going to get the kind of density that he wants with it with a hairline that he wants. Number one. Number two is 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 that he can see just how silly he's going to look. All right. I have a high hairline. I'm, I, you know, I'm, am I, you know, it, it goes all the way up here. It, I, would I prefer to be down here? Yeah, sure. I would have loved for it to be where it was when I was 17, 18 years old. But it's not realistic. Um, it's not, it, and it's not preferable. You don't want to look silly. You want to make sure that your hairline is appropriate for your age and that it's appropriate for your ethnicity as well. Because, um, you know, people, people who are, um, Caucasians. Uh, I'm I'm kind of a mix. I'm I'm you know I'm Spanish. I've got some Eastern European Jew, and I've got some some Colombian in me. So I've got a, I've got a mix. Um, what? Tell me know. about the diameter of your hair. Did you get the uh, Did you get the Hispanic diameter? <laughs> I got the John Cole diameter. <laughs> um, I, I I think that this is really important to know, and this goes back to you know uh, one of the things that you really have to be careful with when you're getting a hairline design. Um, you want to make sure, and that, that was one of the other things that was great about FU Europe. There was some really great lectures by um, uh, Dr. Shapiro, and he was talking about how you go about drawing a hairline, uh, you know, where you start in the parietal humps, where they meet the uh, uh, midline. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, so I don't remember the details, but there's an art to this, and you want to make sure that um, the, the hairline is appropriate to your age and it's appropriate to, to your ethnicity. Um, you do not want, um, you know, you don't want an Asian hairline on a Caucasian head. You don't want um, an African hairline on a Caucasian head because it's going to look strange. Um, and the, the last thing that you want is, is you want your hair, your hair transplant to look odd. You know, um, the, the, uh, the big joke you always hear Joe Tillman talking about is the Turkish hairline, right? The Turkish hairline is, is this hairline that goes like this. Yep. Like a yeah, it's, you know, we, I call that the transvestite hairline. You know, where it's just like it's just like all the way across like this, and it's like first of all, it takes a lot of grafts to fill that in, oh, yeah. right? They, they, they're like you see the counts coming out of there, five thousand five hundred. It's like all right, what's this guy going to do in the future? <laughs> you know, he's tapped you know, out. You build out this enormously low hairline, and and then you top, you know you max that poor son of a bitch out. You freaking you decimate his his uh, donor area. So it looks like, you know, it looks like he, he's got mange back there, you know, like a, like a mangy dog, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then what, you know, um, you want, you, you want to be conservative. You want to, like I said, you want a hairline that's appropriate for your age and appropriate for your, for your ethnicity. And you don't want to burn all of your grafts in one go. The other thing that's also really important is you don't, uh, and again, Dr. Cole can talk about this. You want to try to avoid doing too much dense packing because there's only so much. Um, it, it's like it's like what happens if you try to load too many people into a car, right? If you if you if you go ahead and you put four people in a car, it'll drive just fine. But then you try to pile 15 people into a Volkswagen. First of all, people will be hanging out and it'll be unsafe because people will fall out with the windows or whatever. The shocks will compress in the car, and it won't be able to move. 
or if you know you get going, you won't, your brakes won't work because your car will be too heavy, et cetera, et cetera. If you put too many hair follicles into a particular area of skin, you're going to get risk of things like necrosis. Okay, so necrosis is really bad. That's where you lose all our grafts in a given area. So you you know you burn through all those grafts and then you're you're stuck with the you know with this horrible scar and this dead area of scalp and a loss. So you know that's another thing that you people really need. I, to be I, aware I, of. I want to add in if you if you do enough procedures into a certain area or or, or do something like that, you also risk scalp uh, scalp poisoning, which means if you even if you had the density to do more, um, you run the risk of it not taking at all. Yeah, exactly. So that and that's that's like I said, that's the least of your problems, right? You could you could you could start you could starve the grafts because there's not enough blood supply. You got too many grafts and not enough blood. You could you could cause necrosis because the surrounding tissue that you've implanted in falls apart, so that the grafts just you know they literally fall apart. Um, you know, or or like I said, or your you know your dense pack. You know, a lot of people do dense packing will cause the hairs to basically be placed at a at a screwy angle. Which can make things look a little weird. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I think we covered that a little bit. The cockatoo look, this hair, this yeah, way. That, um, it, it's far better for you to do a first pass, like what Dr. Cole did, with a maximum of about forty grafts per square centimeter, and uh, then forty to fifty. Hmm. Forty forty to fifty grafts per square centimeter, depending on the amount of loss. You know and then and then essentially, you know, revisit and for a second pass. To see, hey, you know, maybe you got back some of those donors, some of you got some of that regen, you know, and see how the hair grows in, see whether, you know, see whether you want to tweak a little bit. So doing second passes make a lot of sense as well. And you, and done, you mentioned yeah. you, you mentioned you were pretty happy with your donor area too, you know, um, uh, well, after a couple couple weeks or so, once it kind of grew back in, once you start talking about that 4,500 range, um, donor ears can sometimes thin out, you know, and we don't, the, the key to that is not solving one problem, only create another. You know, you were checking that area, man, this feels thinner and sure enough, okay, we got some growth back there and that will dissipate yeah. where we take from in the, in the future. Where did that growth come back in from? So we can do an even distribution. Absolutely. And then there's another side to that as well. If you're going to really hammer, um, hammer your donor area and pull a whole lot of hairs out, not only are you going to pull out hairs that are not going to grow back. But all of that extra trauma can sometimes harm the adjacent hairs that are right there because you just you know you're just hammering away at the flesh and um, you know you could you could cause you could cause death in the surrounding hairs. Um, that's something that also happens with strip, where when you do a strip, you create additional scalp tension specifically around the um, around the uh, where where the uh, the scar is, and that can cause um, shock loss to the surrounding follicles, and some of those may not come back either. So it's the same kind of thing when you're, when you're doing too much aggressive extraction. You can cause damage to the surrounding follicles that you didn't even mean to pull. Yeah, tra traction alopecia is a nightmare, but <laughs> no different than wearing your hair too tight or, or in dreads. Um, it's just Sorry, a shame to do something like that. Whole you, know, you, you, you I mean, think of it this way. You have a you have a piece of cloth, right? And you're pulling on it, and mm -hmm. it's strong. And then you start making all these holes in that piece of cloth. You start pulling on that whole cloth, it's going to stretch a lot more, and it's going to be a lot weaker, right? That's what's going to happen to that donor area. If you have any questions and want to talk to us next show, give us a call in. I will put that number on the board, 240-393-2000. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and you take care and have a great one.